So I think David, you know, I think that that summary by Tony uh, puts us on alert for what may be a paradigm shift in what's available in the frontline setting with respect to TKIs. Now, having said that, we're, we're challenged by uh, almost every trial that's pivotal in the frontline setting using IOs uses sunitinib as its control arm. Uh, but the IOs have entered our world in the second line setting and they're soon to enter our world because the trials have been completed or close to being completed in the frontline setting. So talk, talk to us about, about what your thoughts are about the evolution of IOs to the frontline and then we'll expand that with Eric speaking about some combination therapies. Sure. So <clears throat> I think we have a long track record, 20 years of using immunotherapy in the front line with interleukin-2 and a lack of development uh, with that. We've done some trials. We did an atinostat trial with high dose IL-2 that looks interesting that needs follow-up. So first line immunotherapy is something that, that may be worth pursuing. We have several trials that are about to report. So we have uh, and some of them are classic IOs, some of them are other uh, types of therapies. Ipilimumab, nivolumab versus standard dose sunitinib. Uh, standard dose sunitinib uh, with the addition of the Argus uh, vaccine product, uh, AGS003, um, and also a couple of others that are, that are coming. Um, and so from, from that perspective, how do we sort this out versus cabozantinib? And I think the answer is uh, we're gonna have to do other trials. I'm fine with sunitinib being a standard the way we're using it because we, we've, we, we now have more than a decade of, of understanding what that gives us. But if we're going to get two changes in the benchmark, in other words, uh, particularly if the CABOSUN overall survival data are, are, are positive, so show an overall survival advantage versus standard dose sunitinib, and one of the immunotherapy trials hits and, and changes our paradigm, uh, I think we've got a problem. We, we, we have in one way rationalized our choice, uh, but we have a choice between IO in combination, generally with a VEGF TKI or, or a vaccine, uh, and uh, a, a TKI, uh, <coughs> which might be the third generation VEGF TKI in the form of, of cabozantinib. And, and that's gonna be a problem for us. Uh, how do I deal with that? Well, I'm involved in a lot of these trials. Uh, it's very interesting that we've been able to build the way we have. Um, and uh, I think we're going to start looking at combinations of cabozantinib, which has some immune effects uh, with some of the immuno-oncology drugs, and I think that's very interesting. There's a great trial uh, from Andrea uh, Apollo in both renal uh, cell and urothelial cancer. She's presenting uh, some more data on it uh, at this meeting, uh, which I, I think is a very good one. And these are the sorts of trials we're going to have to do and build upon if we're going to address this question. So, Eric. Um we're, we're on the precipice of really understanding uh, whether IOs alone or in combination, whether it's in combination with another IO or in combination with a targeted agent, are going to be ready for prime time very, in the not too distant future. Any insights into your thoughts, mechanism, approaches uh, about these trials and, and how we're gonna have to think about them? Yeah, so, so let's talk about whether there's any rationale for, for example, a TKI-IO combination. Uh, we, we have some data from our, our sunitinib pre-surgical study that shows that if you look at sunitinib-treated renal cell carcinomas compared to untreated controls, it seems to increase T-cell infiltrate, uh, which uh, one of the challenges in terms of how IOs don't work is if you don't get the immune cells into the microenvironment, it's a problem. If they're in there, then you have a checkpoint that, that's counter-regulating, that's a problem. So, so it possibly with a combination of anti-VEGF therapy, and we're not sure how it does it, um, and there's a couple of putative mechanisms that are being investigated, but there's a rationale for that combination. Maybe what you're doing is you're creating an immunologically hot environment, and then you're knocking down the key checkpoint that's preventing those activated T cells then from, from, from killing the tumor. Obviously, if you, you look at studies and, and review articles, there's tons of checkpoints. And how do we actually approach a patient and when we have this panoply of agents and choices? 
And I think it really comes down to really being able to understand individual tumor biology. And again, this is a process of an evolution, of evolution. Now, you know, the, what we're doing is we're doing clinical trials, um, early phase clinical trials with lots of biopsies. It's, I sort of call the Model T Ford, perhaps, of, 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 of monitoring immune biology. And we really need to move beyond that. Are there some promising combinations? As, um, uh, as David was just commenting before, you know, a drug like cabozantinib, which is also modulating both the innate uh, immune system as well as the, uh, the adaptive immune uh, system potentially, could be very, very exciting. So I think those combinations, I, I really look forward to seeing how, how efficacious they are. And there's a number of clinical trials that are, are, are coming down the pipeline. In terms of clinical trials, at uh, this GEOASCO, there is a trial of a tezolizumab, which is a PD-L1 inhibitor, plus bevacizumab, versus a tezolizumab alone versus sunitinib, which is a 305 patient study, which is uh, being presented by David McDermott. And the data show that from a progression-free survival perspective, if you don't select for PDL1, um, there isn't a great big difference. Uh, even when you do select for PDL1, which up until now hasn't really been shown to be a good predictive biomarker in other studies, um, there's a trend towards improved uh, detection. The, the overall response rate in this trial, um, the, the progression uh, free status at one year are, are modest, but I think we really need to probably dig into this trial a little bit more to see whether maybe there's some gold in there. For example, we don't yet know what the CR rate is in the in these arms. Um, that just uh, these are these are the sorts of data that uh, we're probably going to find out um, at the course of this meeting, and these will help us then decide on whether or not this is a, a a harbinger of great things to come or a cautionary tale.